immediately, Anonymous's message became not just about Internet censorship, but also about standing up to the church and bringing awareness to its violations of human rights. I simply cannot express how much this meant to me. Up until then, it felt as though I and a few others had been fighting the church with our backs to the wall. People were telling me I was crazy, wrong, and suppressive. To see a group of people rise up like this in defense of the many who had been wronged by the church was a huge testament to the kindness of the human race. Most of these people had no previous involvement with the church. Unlike the media, this group wasn't afraid of what the church said or about getting sued. Now it felt like there was a whole army in our corner. Anonymous organized a worldwide protest on February 10, 2008. It was the first of many. Members of the group wore Guy Fox masks to protect their identities, knowing the church harassed detractors as they rallied outside Scientology sites all over the world. They brought a huge amount of attention to the subject and made the church squirm. In the meantime, many ex-Scientologists who had previously been anonymous were now coming out, including Mark and Claire Headley. As it turned out, Mark was the anonymous blogger with the screen name Blown for Good. Inspired by all the activism we'd been witnessing, Dallas and I started putting together ideas for our own website, with some sort of information center and even a non-profit group for people who had left the church and needed help. Around this time, an ex-Scientologist, Kendra Wiseman, contacted me. Her father was president of Scientology's Citizens Commission on Human Rights, a watchdog group with an anti-psychiatry agenda. Kendra had her own bad experiences with the church and wanted to start a website to be called xscientologykids.com. She told me that she had already spoken to Astra Woodcraft, another prominent church critic, about the project. Astra had been in the church since she was a kid and left the Sea Org because she refused to have an abortion. The two women asked me to come on board, and I was instantly in. When Kendra showed me the site and what she had put together, I found it both perfect and amazing. It gave great information on the church that could be understood by anyone. It offered help to those who had left, as well as a community for people to share their views. The site was launched on March 1st, 2008. It was immediately the subject of many news and magazine articles and radio interviews. Many ex-Scientologists were active in the online forums, sharing their stories, offering support, and talking about their experiences. Meanwhile, in the aftermath of my letter, Astra, Kendra, and I were being recruited by the media to tell our stories. I started getting calls from Glamour, the Los Angeles Times, and ABC's Nightline. Shortly after our site was launched, I did an interview with Nightline's Lisa Fletcher. By the end of the interview, she was in tears. It was the first time I had publicly told my entire story. Right before Nightline was getting ready to air the piece, its producers called the church for comment. Several days later, they heard back. The church was extremely threatening, causing ABC to hold off airing the story. That same night, Dallas received a phone call from his father at 11 o'clock. He said he was 20 minutes from our house and was arriving with two very high-ranking church execs from the Office of Special Affairs, who wanted to speak with us. I didn't know this until later, but they had actually chartered a helicopter from L.A. to make the trip. Their business was so urgent. They wanted to stop the Nightline interview from airing. I told Dallas's father that they weren't welcome unless they were there to apologize. A couple of minutes later, the phone rang a second time. It was one of the OSA execs traveling with Dallas's father. After a while, Dallas and I agreed to meet Dallas's parents and the two OSA reps at a Denny's restaurant nearby because it was the only place open that late at night. The meeting started off with abusive comments from the two OSA reps about our behavior, our families, and our attitudes. One falsely called my mother a whore. The other said I was using my uncle's name to get my 15 minutes of fame. They were clearly living in their own world, and Dallas and I saw no point in arguing with people who were so detached from reality. But Dallas's parents insisted that we stay and try to come to some sort of resolution, so we tried to oblige them. Finally, we got down to the real reason for the visit. The execs pleaded with me to pull the ABC Nightline deal and refused to do additional interviews. They tried to bargain with me. If I did, they said they would lift the declare on my Aunt Sarah and several of my friends, allowing them to speak to their families. Dallas's parents were also pleading with us to cooperate. 
Otherwise, they would have to choose between Scientology and us. Everybody was trying to force us to make a decision right then and there, but we said we'd think about it. Before departing, we were asked not to talk to anybody about this meeting and not to post about it on the Internet. There was no way I was going to pull the Nightline deal. But Dallas and I were torn about refusing additional interviews. Even before the church's plea, we'd been on the fence about whether or not we would continue doing interviews. Through the website, we would continue to bring a good amount of attention to the stories coming out of the church. But both of us knew what that decision would mean. It would mean that once again the church would have power over our lives. There was something about giving the church the satisfaction of that, which made us feel like we'd be enabling them to do more to us and others. In the end, we decided against it. The next morning, we went out for breakfast and to do a few errands. As we got onto the freeway, Dallas took note of a white Ford sedan also getting onto the freeway, although he said nothing to me. As we switched freeways and went another ten miles, he noticed the same car still behind us. We got into downtown San Diego with its many stoplights and one-way streets. The same car stayed behind us, although maneuvering so as not to be directly in Dallas's rearview mirror. I stopped by my office to pick up some items and came out 15 minutes later. The same car was down the street on a side road. After I closed my door, Dallas jerked the car into motion and took off into traffic. Geez, slow down, I told him, backseat driving as usual. Jenna, I think we are being followed. Do you see that white Ford three lanes right of us? I'm going to make the next left, and he will swerve across and follow us. Just as Dallas had predicted, the car made the exact same moves as we did. We were being followed. Dallas kept driving around the same few blocks to see how many times this guy was going to keep it up before realizing we were on to him. We managed to get a picture of his license plate when he pulled out in front of us. When we turned into a parking lot, he followed us, but took off when we got out and started walking toward his car. As if the mysterious car weren't enough, the church was still trying to get to us through Dallas's parents. In April 2008, Dallas and I decided to participate in a protest organized by Anonymous to be staged at all the Scientology sites in L.A., as well as at various Scientology sites around the world. Again, the focus was on families and disconnection. The night before the protest, the church's new PR person, Tommy Davis, called Dallas's father and told him we were going to a rally with terrorists. Upset, Dallas's parents wanted to meet with Dallas alone. Dallas refused, and he and I went out to dinner. As usual, we were followed, this time by a guy driving a car with no license plates. The driver sped away when he realized we were taking pictures of his vehicle. I called Tommy Davis myself, to no avail. Even though I left several messages, I never got a call back. The guy was obviously a coward, just like so many others in the Office of Special Affairs who would go to great lengths to disparage us to our families, but would never go head-to-head -head with you. I'd stopped being surprised by this behavior, but at the same time it was hard not to be startled by the apparent lengths that they were willing to go to in order to disrupt our lives. They seemed to operate in their own small world where they could do what they wanted to whomever they wanted, and yet they had so little sense of what was going on beyond the borders of their own little world. They would take shots from over the walls and then hide behind them just as quickly, so they never came to realize just how removed from reality they were. Upset as I was about the suspicious cars and their attempts to squeeze us through Dallas's parents, I was more disturbed by what those actions demonstrated about the church. The distance between their world and the real world was on full display. This wasn't just about controlling the people in the church. It was about controlling any and everyone around them, no matter what the cost. On the morning of the protest, Dallas and I drove to L.A., where we met Astra and several other friends. Dallas and I had the jitters, as we had never demonstrated before. However, when we got there and saw how many people had turned out, it turned out to be very uplifting and made us feel supported. It was a blazing hot day, and there were at least 200 protesters. Everybody was wearing masks, and we were all picketing outside the blue building on Fountain Avenue. There were tons of ex-Scientologists, many of whom had already done so much to raise awareness. The Headleys also turned out at the protest that day. We started at Pack, where the church had security guards blocking their road, L. Ron Hubbard Way. We protested on Sunset Boulevard instead. 
People honked in support of us. Some of the protesters used megaphones to voice their anti-Scientology message. Various media outlets were there to cover the story, and we all readily gave them sound bites. I was startled to recognize two other protesters in particular, Mark Bunker and Tori Christman, whom I remembered from protests at the flag base in Clearwater. They had been part of the Lisa McPherson Trust and had frequently picketed the base. I remembered the briefings we used to get about handling these guys. It was disturbing to think about it now, yet here they were, still protesting against the church. It was an empowering day and a big success. I felt extremely thankful to Anonymous for organizing it. Many of them have not personally experienced the evils of the church, so it said a lot that they were there standing up for people they didn't even know. For so many years, I had felt that I was alone in my feeling that something was wrong with the way people were treated in the Sea Org. Now I felt as though there was an army of us. As we drove home that night, Dallas and I noticed that we were again being followed, this time by two cars. I called OSA the next day to speak to Tommy Davis, but of course he was not available and never returned my call. Later in the day, Dallas' parents called to say they wanted to speak with Dallas alone. He agreed to meet them at their house, where he learned they had just come from a meeting with several execs from the church. They had been shown photos of us holding signs at the protest and told that we had been hanging with people from Anonymous, which they described as a criminal organization. As it turned out, Dallas's parents had been having meetings with church execs, who had been trying to convince them that Dallas and I were bad people. They even went so far as to say that the only reason Dallas had married me was that he wanted to take over my uncle's position in the church. These secret meetings often resulted in tension and heated arguments between Dallas and me and his parents, but we knew what we were doing was right. This wasn't just about Dallas's family. It was about the dozens of others we would be helping. About a week passed before Dallas's mother called him again. She told him the church had contacted her to say that ABC was going to air the Nightline interview, and they asked her to write a letter to the producers requesting that they not broadcast it. They wanted her to tell them that Dallas and I were liars, and had asked her husband and son to do the same. She said she told them that she didn't want to get involved. To this day, I don't know if any of them wrote letters against us on behalf of the church. Ultimately, Despite all the church's efforts, the Nightline interview aired, and even with all of the drama that had surrounded it, I felt a huge sense of relief. The tumultuous few weeks of dealing with the church had made me more convinced than ever that the only way to bring attention to those human rights violations was to do it from the outside. Theirs was such an all-consuming world that the only way true change would ever come about would be if people out here in the real world came to see the risks that Scientology posed. It was up to all of us who had left to reveal the truth about our experiences because only then would the world see this organization for what it really was. In the aftermath of the interview, visits to our website soared. We had so many hits that we moved to the first entry on the Google search page for the keyword Scientology. We got tons of email from people asking us to help them find their children or other family members in the church, and in many cases, we were able to help. More than anything, these kinds of pleas showed me that we were doing the right thing. The sheer volume of emails was unbelievable. The site continues to average more than 200,000 hits a month. Even more rewarding is the number of thank yous we receive from people all over the world. I am proud that the website has become a valuable tool to warn people about the dangers of Scientology, help them find loved ones they have lost to the church, provide support to those in need, and bring awareness through school programs and the media. Chapter 34 One Life The longer I was out, the more I came to understand that my life had been owned by the church. For years I had sensed that something was wrong. Learning the truth about what had gone on behind the scenes shed new light on my suspicions. I was astonished to hear how high up in the church concern and control over my time as a Sea Org member had gone. In late fall 2007, my parents called to tell me that Mike Rinder was in their living room. I immediately assumed he must be there to either handle them or gather information about me. To my surprise, neither was true. 
He'd had a falling out with my uncle over a BBC television segment about Scientology, and in the aftermath, Mike had walked out of the church. I was shocked. I had just seen Mike on television a few weeks earlier, defending the church. Mike Rinder leaving was huge. I wondered what had become of Kathy, BJ, and Taryn. My parents told me that the rest of Mike's family had disowned him. Months later, when Mike had a chance to cool off after his departure from the church, we heard his first-hand accounts of the so-called handlings of my parents and me. He told me that he and Marty Rathbun had been assigned to handle my parents when they'd first announced they were leaving the Sea Org in 2000. They'd made their decision to leave known, then locked themselves in their room at the int base and refused to open the door. Mike and Marty were in Clearwater at the time, but Uncle Dave considered this a big enough problem that he ordered them back to Int immediately to deal with it. Mike described my uncle as micromanaging in their dealing with my parents. He demanded reports on anything that transpired and dictated endless orders as to what was to be done. This is what Mike told me. At the outset, my father was refusing to talk to anyone, especially his brother, so Uncle Dave instructed Mike and Marty to split my parents up, even if it meant physically taking my father out of the room. He then instructed them to security check both my parents. Everything they said was to be reported to Uncle Dave in detail. Several days later, when my parents still hadn't changed their minds about leaving, Uncle Dave unleashed his fury, calling Mike and Marty incompetent and incapable, before telling them that he would speak to his brother himself. The two met on the Star of California, the ship replica at the Int base, where Uncle Dave offered my father $100,000 to have only my mom leave. The move failed to convince my father to stay. As it became clear that my parents were leaving, my uncle wanted them out of the country, so my father randomly selected Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, as the place they would settle. This worked out well for the church, as a private investigator for the church ran a local ATV, all-terrain vehicle, rental shop there, so he could keep an eye on them. Uncle Dave was concerned that they would be subpoenaed for deposition in the Lisa McPherson case if they were in the United States. It was only later that Mike learned why Uncle David had been so afraid, which was that Uncle David had told my parents that he had supervised her auditing during the period before her death. My parents had no intention of creating problems for the church, but they had to go anyway. They finally agreed when they were told that I would be joining them there. Uncle Dave had assured them that he would be the one handling me. Anne Rathbun, of course, handled me, although it turns out she had been supervised directly by Uncle Dave. I had always wondered how much Uncle Dave knew about what was going on with me when my parents were leaving. Mike said that after I had been sent back to Los Angeles from Flag, Uncle Dave's plan had been to resettle me in Mexico with my parents, regardless of what I wanted. Apparently, my uncle told Mike many times that I was a spoiled brat who contributed nothing to the Sea Org, so it would be no loss to get me out and would keep my parents happy. When I refused to go, the whole plan had to be rethought. It was telling that Uncle Dave was always pulling the strings but never showing his face. All those hours that Marty and Mike had left me alone in the conference room, claiming to have forgotten me, they were in Uncle Dave's 11th floor office, being subjected to his rage. He was furious about their incompetence in failing to deal with a young girl who, in his estimation, was not only lazy and incapable of doing anything useful, but also too stupid to think for herself. I wasn't surprised that my uncle had said these things about me. Doing it behind my back was a way to keep himself unaccountable. From everything I learned about him, he thought he was the only one capable of doing anything right. Mike said that it was the first time that he had been ordered to persuade someone to leave the Sea Org and didn't feel right about it. My uncle had not banked on how indoctrinated I was. When they told him that I wanted to stay, Uncle Dave was frustrated. He still wanted me to go, but in the end, he said that I was a better Sea Org member than either Mike or Marty, which was his way of signaling that it was okay for me to stay. When I was asked to make the phone call to my parents to tell them it had been my decision to stay, I didn't realize how much discussion had already gone on. Apparently, my father demanded to speak to me, but Uncle Dave would not allow it. He wasn't willing to get on the phone himself, so he listened via speakerphone and had Mike and Marty speak for him. Only after my mother became threatening did Dave decide my parents could talk to me. After hearing how involved my uncle had been in my parents leaving, 
I wasn't surprised to learn that Uncle Dave had also been responsible for the handling of Dallas's and my departure. Not only was he aware of what was going on, he was directing all the action. He'd been responsible for all the sneaking around and trying to convince Dallas to stay. He'd been encouraging people to keep Dallas in and push me out. It was unlikely that this had anything to do with Dallas himself. Though Dallas and I had been married for three years, Uncle Dave had never met him. It seemed more about making my life miserable and creating as many barriers as possible for us. Family meant nothing to him. Uncle Dave had kept track of me far beyond that which I had imagined. I knew that I was being controlled and that there was a system in place, but I never knew that it came down to a single person. What struck me once again was how he always had his decisions carried out by others. He insulated himself from his actions and the human toll that they took. He didn't have to confront the uncomfortable questions that his decisions raised about just how disconnecting people from their families served the greater good and what any of this had to do with Scientology. Perhaps the most surprising thing about hearing all this was that I wasn't surprised. By the time I spoke to Mike Rinder, I'd heard so many bad things about my uncle's behavior from former Scientologists that there was little left that could shock me. Everyone who left the church had a story about him and what he'd done. My story wasn't very different from theirs. In the end, not even my last name could spare me from my uncle's watchful eye. I am no longer a believer. I am not religious. I believe in what I can see. Dallas believes in the possibility of God, past lives, reincarnation, and karma. I believe in the possibility of these things, but I do not count on them or incorporate them into my thinking. It was a huge adjustment of perspective to realize that the life I am living may be my one and only. All the people I know who are still in the church may be wasting the only life they have. However, having one life also allows me to see the beauty of it, what a miracle it is that we can live and how important it is to be an individual. Nobody in this world was born to be the same as anyone else. Turning people into robots, especially children, is a crime against nature itself. There is so much beauty in humanity, and I've only been able to appreciate it in the last few years. I am touched by actions like those of families concerned enough to try to protect their kids from Scientology, people who have let me cry on their shoulder, and supported me in speaking out against Scientology. Dallas's whole non-Scientology family, who are as genuine and truly caring as they come, and authority figures that I have in my new life, who are caring and compassionate despite the power they hold. My mother recently moved to California to be closer to her grandchildren. She is a doting grandparent, eager to make up for what she missed out on with me. My father still lives in Virginia, Justin and his girlfriend live there, too. Sterling is living abroad. Uncle Dave is still the head of the church. As far as I know, my parents never spoke to him after my departure. I have never talked to him. I tried calling Aunt Shelley years ago, but I never heard anything. She hasn't been seen in public since 2007, but recently, a lawyer spoke out on her behalf, saying that she was fine. He was putting it out there in response to an article in a newspaper or blog saying that she was missing. In 2012, Grandpa Ron, my dad's father who'd brought the whole Miss Cabbage family into the religion in the first place, caused a stir when word got out that he too had left the church. Given his long commitment, it was a nice surprise. To hear him tell it, in the end he simply got fed up with everything and had to leave. In his own words, he escaped. He and his wife Becky are now living with my dad in Virginia. Grandpa Ron was just one of several high-profile people who'd left in recent years, a rapidly growing list that in addition to Mike Rinder also included Marty Rathbun, whose wife Anne remained in the church. The day I signed my book contract, Dallas's parents were declared SPs for refusing to disconnect from us. Dallas's siblings still talk to us, and we love them and see them all the time. Dallas's parents still believe in Scientology itself, but see the corruption within the church and don't agree with how it is being run. As far as the church is concerned, we are obviously SPs, although we still have not been declared so, as far as we are aware. 
We haven't heard from the church in years, and they seem to have stopped following us. While I've moved on in my life, some things in the past are hard to forgive. To me, the church is a dangerous organization whose beliefs allow it to commit crimes against humanity and violate basic human rights. It remains a mystery to me how, in our current society, this can go on unchecked. It is particularly insidious because of its celebrity advocates and affiliated groups, such as Narconon, Applied Scholastics, and the Citizens Commission on Human Rights. I feel that people should be warned about what the Church truly is, who its founder really was, what really goes on there, the lengths it is willing to go to, and what they are willing to sacrifice in the name of achieving their ends. The ends themselves are shrouded in secrecy and conflicting information. Scientology always has been a game of power and control. L. Ron Hubbard was the ultimate con man, and it's hard to figure out how much of Scientology was an experiment in brainwashing and controlling people, and how much of it was truly intended to help people. While I have plenty of reasons to loathe my uncle, I also try to see him for what he once was, a kid who, like so many others, was duped by the system and was too young and irresponsible to make the right choices. By the time he was sixteen and joined the Sea Org, he was already in too deep. He made his choice. I don't know who he would be if he had never encountered Scientology or how much of his personality is shaped by Scientology. Still, it's hard to reconcile the idea of him as a child with the adult he is now. Many former Sea Org members and Scientologists are quick to blame Dave and Dave alone for their experiences. The truth, I feel, is a bit murkier. There's little doubt that my uncle has played a leading role in defining much of how modern Scientology works, but to place blame squarely on him is to miss the larger point. The problem with Scientology is bigger than one man, not just Uncle Dave or LRH. The problem is Scientology itself. The problem is that Scientology is a system that makes it nearly impossible for you to think for yourself. People like my uncle are enablers who create an environment of fear that discourages independent thought. Get rid of them, and you would continue to have a system that almost by definition restricts individual freedoms. Today, when we are in Los Angeles to visit friends, we drive by the base there. We see the Sea Org drones coming and going from the buildings and walking along the sidewalks. They are recognizable by their uniforms and their blank stares. They are in a different world. Looking at them, I find myself taken back to a time not that long ago, when I too wandered mindlessly from building to building. I remember how those walks from one building to another were some of our only encounters with the outside world, and how even during those brief moments outside, people in passing cars would yell at us that we were brainwashed as their cars sped away. At the time, our reaction to the word brainwashed was disbelief. We'd look at each other shocked that we who were seeking the ultimate truths of the universe could be brainwashed. We'd recite Scientology slogans such as Think for yourself to each other and take comfort that we alone could make the world go right. After all, if we were the greater good, then who were they? Seeing the followers walk around now, I have been tempted to yell too, especially when seeing some of my old friends, tempted to help them realize what's going on and bridge the distance between their world and mine. I open my lips to speak, but each time the words catch in my throat. What stops me isn't fear. It's the knowledge that I can't force them to believe anything that they are not ready to believe. Ultimately, Scientologists make a choice about what they believe and make a choice as to whether they're willing to ignore the small but persistent voice inside them saying that something isn't right. The brainwashing by the church teaches people to go against their instincts, and it is too strong, too deeply ingrained for the outside world alone to set things right. The desire to change must come from within. They have to have the realization themselves to believe it. I made a choice that I didn't want to be controlled, and in walking away from everything, I learned the value of listening to the voice in my head telling me what was wrong and standing up for what was right. Being the lone voice of dissent is hard, 
and almost always inconvenient, and there isn't usually instant gratification. However, if you don't speak up, you will most likely regret it, and will have to live with the results. In my experience, often the only reason that the church was allowed to get away with its abusive behavior is that people failed to say no. Saying no is difficult, even brutal at times. But in the long run, many others will appreciate your courage, even if silently, and someday it may lead to them mustering up the courage to stand up for themselves. Of all the gifts that my freedom has given me, perhaps the greatest was the ability to start a family. From the moment I began spending time in Australia with Jeanette and her daughter Eden, I knew that I wanted to be a mother. However, if I'd stayed in the Sea Org, I would have never been allowed to. Leaving gave me the opportunity to discover for myself what it means to have a child. And today, Dallas and I are thankful that we got out young enough to have kids and start a family. Our two beautiful children are a blessing that we never would otherwise have known. For me, the ultimate beauty of humanity was shown to me when I had my first child. Our bodies are capable of creating miracles, regardless of whether we are spirits. In the end, I learned that just being my body was good enough for me. My body allowed me to be a mom, which is by far the best thing about me. We hope you have enjoyed this unabridged recording of Beyond Belief, My Secret Life Inside Scientology and My Harrowing Escape by Jenna Miscavige Hill with Lisa Pulitzer. This program was produced by John Marshall Media. The director was Paula Parker. Executive producer, Karen Jakonski. Text copyright 2013 by Jenna Miscavige Hill. Production copyright 2013 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening. <laughs>